Come on, God bless America. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, let's take one moment while we're standing and pray for this great nation we live in. Let's take just one moment and pray. Come on, if you're comfortable with it, you may want to lift a hand to heaven for one second. Father, we join together now as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the nation that we live in. We thank you for a place where we're free to worship and to preach the gospel and to lift up the name of Jesus. We thank you for our freedom of religion. And we pray now for our nation from New York to L.A., from the north to the south. We speak a blessing over the nation of America. Lord, we thank you for the land that we've come from, and we thank you that it would always be gospel rich. We pray that America would be a place where the gospel is proclaimed, and the goodness of God is talked about, and human life is respected, and the dignity of, of all humanity is lifted high. Father, we pray that you would pour out a revival now in our nation again. Lord, revive our nation from sea to shining sea. We pray that you would work a work so great that the ears of those who hear about it would be caused to tingle. Pour out another great awakening. Come on, let's pray for a great, we pray for a great awakening to come to America in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if you believe for it, go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap and say amen out there. Come on, God bless. America. Amen? Just go ahead and turn to your neighbor this morning. Tell them 1776 Britain stinks. Just tell them that this morning, all right? Tell them that, and you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I love to remind all my British friends in the ministry from time to time of 1776, and I love to remind them that they would be speaking German if it weren't for us. Can I get an amen out there today? I love it. Uh, today we've entitled the, the day we have together God and Country, and the reason we call it God and Country is because it is impossible to separate the reality of God from the American experience. Let me say it again, it is impossible to separate the reality of God from the American experience. Can I get an amen out there? If you look at the way our nation was framed and the way our nation was founded, we were founded in response to Britain's overreach and their taxation without representation of us as a nation, and really our lack of freedom here as the colonialists struggled to make a life in a new world. And because Britain tried to oppress and Britain tried to hold down and to really pull resources out of something that was just young and started, there was a revolt of sorts that came out of Boston that began to shape a whole new world where humanity would live in freedom and the American experiment would begin. I want you to know that the people that started this uh, revolt, rebellion, this, this turnaround and fight for our independence and our institution as Americans, they were largely Christian people. 
You know, there's been uh, different voices that have shown up in America in recent years, many of them trying to rewrite history as it were, making America not look like an American nation. But I got news for all of them. If they study the history of our nation, if they study who the people were that framed the Constitution, you cannot separate the founding of America from a Christian worldview. America is a Christian nation, will be a Christian nation, and was founded as a Christian nation. Can I get an amen out there? Let me tell you something about the, the first groups of people that came to this nation to found it from Europe. Uh, they're coming from Europe looking for a better, a new way of life. And the stats on the people that first came to the shores here and, and, and really began to move in in large mass, 98% of that population would have claimed to be Protestant as their religion. They were a group of people that were heavily influenced by Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation that had happened in Europe. And there are people that had values like this. They believed things like by faith alone. Come on, everybody say by faith alone. They believed only by faith you could have salvation in God. They believed things like sola scriptura or by the scripture alone. Come on, somebody say by the scripture alone. Let's say it like we mean it, by the scripture alone. That they believed that real truth only came from the scripture. They believe things like by Christ alone. Come on, somebody say by Christ alone. They believe that only through Jesus could a person be born again and be right and have a relationship with heaven. These people were thoroughly Christian. They had a Christian worldview. 98% of them were Protestant in faith. The other 2% of them, 1.7% of them, were Roman Catholic. And they held to the belief that Jesus was Messiah. So 98% of them were Protestant like most of the people in this room are. The other 1.7% of them that, that started during the time the Constitution was framed were Roman Catholic and believed that Jesus was Messiah. Come on, both of those groups are Christian in nature, our brothers and our sisters. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for all of the people that call Jesus Messiah on the planet. Amen? We, we, we love all the different flavors of the body of Christ. But, so you're talking 98% uh, Protestant, 1.7% Roman Catholic. And then there were a few thousand Jewish believers that came with them as well, did not receive Jesus as Messiah, but they did have faith in the God of Israel, believed that the Torah and the prophets and the Old Testament books were reality and given to them by the hand of God. I want you to see that America was founded by Christians. And so Christianity and the substance of the scriptures runs throughout all of our founding documents as a nation. You cannot separate the fact that the people who wrote the Constitution were influenced by the Beatitudes. You cannot separate the fact that the people who wrote the Constitution were influenced by the Ten Commandments. You cannot separate the fact that the people who wrote the Constitution had read about the fruit of the Spirit. Of the signers of the Constitution, many of them were clergy, many of them were sons of clergy, and almost all of them were church members, most of them Episcopalian or Presbyterian, a few, very few Roman Catholics in there, uh, other Congregationalists, but all Bible-believing people. Aren't you thankful that the nation that you live in was founded by a group of Bible-believing, church-attending men of the Most High God? Come on, somebody ought to give God a hand clap for that reality today. We live in a nation that was founded by Christian men. See, Christianity and America have been in step since the beginning. As a matter of fact, when the first president of the United States of America was sworn into office, he was in New York because at that point the capital city of America was New York. That's where he was sworn in. Was not yet Washington, D.C. And so he would have been at the federal building, federal hall on Wall Street. He receives the position and, and, and enters into the presidency. And President George Washington at that point would have walked out of the federal building on Wall Street and he would have walked down towards what we know now to be Ground Zero or the area where the Twin Towers fell. And he walked into a small chapel there by the name of St. Paul's Chapel, probably the most important historical American church house 
that we have on this continent. St. Paul's Chapel, if you're ever in New York, you ought to go see it. And he walked into that building and he was greeted there by preachers and pastors and clergymen, men of God, who one of the first actions George Washington took as the President of the United States was to walk to St. Paul's Chapel, submit himself to the preachers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, have hands laid upon him. He was anointed with oil and prophesied over about the future of America. Now, does that sound like a nation that might have been rooted in Christianity? Can I get an amen out there? And this was the word that was spoken over Washington in St. Paul's Chapel back in the 1780s and over America. The the man of God presiding over the meeting laid hands on him and said, as long as America is a Christian nation that's founded on Christian principles, we pronounce a blessing on America. But the moment America turns from its roots and its Christian principles, we pronounce a curse on America. Now I'm going to tell you, as long as America will believe the things of God, preach the gospel, take care of missions, and push the church forward, we will be blessed as a nation. But if we let the DNA of our nation be torn away from us, and we move from something that is godly to something that is godless, a curse will come upon our ground. See, God has blessed America because America has blessed God. Can I get an amen out there? But if America starts to to curse God, the blessing of God will lift off of our nation. And I believe this with all of our heart. I I believe this with all of my heart that America, where we are as a nation, is we're somewhere between warning. Come on, somebody say warning. We're somewhere between warning and judgment. And if you look at, at, at the, pretty much the history of nations in the Bible, the Lord will start warning nations about their future and about who they are. And they have a space of time to repent and to turn and to make things right. And if they do that, they will miss judgment and grace will come to them as a people. Do you know this, that not only individuals will be judged before God at the end of time, but nations themselves will stand before God to be judged as a people. There are multiple judgments at the end of time. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my life to be right by the blood of Jesus, and I want my country to be one that still stands for the values of the Most High God. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap if you want that. Come on. We want the blessing of God, amen, on our nation. It's interesting that, that of all the places, whenever Ground Zero happened and the Twin Towers fell, In uh, 01, way back when, whenever those towers fell, there was shock waves that came from such massive buildings hitting the ground. And it destroyed the foundation of almost everything else in that square around Ground Zero. It all had to be rebuilt. The one edifice that stood strong and didn't fall was St. Paul's Chapel. It's the one thing. And I believe it's a prophetic sign, amen? Amen. That if something's built upon the right things and there's a covenant and a, and a word from heaven, how many of you know, if you got a covenant and a word from heaven, it doesn't matter what falls around you. It doesn't matter what shockwaves come. You can stand strong in the midst of the fire. And I believe it's a word from the Lord to us and a sign for good. Can I get an amen? Come on. That, that little chapel received the name. It, it, it's called the little chapel that stood. It's what New Yorkers call it now, the little chapel that stood. See, I want you to see that, that Christianity is so ingrained in our nation. Think about these, these statements that have been made by different presidents throughout the years. There's only ever been one president that ever said publicly that America was not a Christian nation. Only one president ever said that. No other president has ever made that claim, only one. I'll leave it up for you to study to find out who that one was, all right? But uh, here's what the other president said about America. John Adams said this about American Christianity. He said, The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Teddy Roosevelt said this, said the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure to ourselves what the life would be if these teachings were removed. Roosevelt said it's impossible to remove the teachings of Christianity from who we are as American. 
Uh, Woodrow Wilson said this, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness, which are derived from the revelation of the Holy Scripture. Herbert Hoover said this. He said, uh, America life has been built and can alone survive upon the fundamental philosophy announced by the Savior 19 centuries ago. Harry Truman said these words, this is a Christian nation. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap that this is, it is a Christian nation. Listen, America was birthed looking for freedom, freedom from tyranny. And as we did that, they came up and the framers, uh, finally, they, they fashioned our Declaration of Independence because we believe that people had rights and that people were made in the image of God and people had a value and people should be able to pursue some sort of life for themselves. These are the words that were crafted in, in, in the Declaration of Independence. It says this, if you haven't heard them in a while, I'd like to read a few of them again this morning. It says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The declaration ends with these words. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. These guys that fought for the framing of the Constitution, fought to declare independence against Britain and their tyranny. Most of these men gave great sacrifices to the cause that we are uh, as Americans so that we could live and walk and be in freedom. And here's some of the things they bought for us that I think we hold as, as values and we see as Americans, and I believe they come from the Word of God. Number one, we have the freedom of religion. Is anybody thankful out there this morning that we can talk about the things of God and not have to do it in fear? Come on, and don't have to meet a government checklist. Come on, somebody. We got brothers and sisters around the world this morning. It is not like that, I promise you. They, they live in fear. They, they preach in fear. Their churches are only small home churches because they can't draw any, uh, any eyes on themselves. But in America, we have a, a freedom of religion. Second thing we have is we have the freedom of, of speech. And I'm thankful for the freedom of speech, even for those that I disagree with, right? Because if they can't say what they want to say, I can't say what I want to say. Come on, let's give God a hand clap that we can, we can say what we want, even if we shouldn't, right? You can say it. Just turn to your neighbor and say you shouldn't have said that. Just tell them that. Uh, you got a freedom of speech, yeah. Yeah, but maybe we shouldn't have used it. All right. Uh, third thing we have here is we have the freedom of press. That's that we, we can have press and they can cover stories. And we used to get a better story from the press, but we still have that freedom today. We have the right to bear arms, and we love that right in Kentucky. I know you do. So we have, we have a protection from unreasonable search and seizure. Protections of right to life, specific rights, and protections in legal manners. See, uh, uh, America's been built upon the idea that you are worth something. And you shouldn't live under tyranny. You shouldn't live in slavery. I believe this, that no man should live in slavery. No man should be a slave. Now, America doesn't have a perfect history. You won't find a perfect nation on the earth. But we can see this nation that the grace of God and the blessing of God's come upon it. In America, it doesn't matter what kind of, of civil injustices there have been around the world. America is almost always a leader in making the wrongs right throughout the world. We're some of the first people to make the move. Why is it like that? I think it's that because the grace of God and the gospel is here. See, we have a longing on the inside of us to see men live free. Where does that longing to see men live free come from? I believe it comes from one place. It comes from God in heaven, the Father of lights, who created you with purpose and created you for freedom and created you to go after something and to fulfill his plan in your life. That's really what the American dream is all about. Really, I think more than it's an American dream, it's a gospel dream. 
See, God so loved us that he didn't want us living under the tyranny of any oppressor. Can I get an amen out there? God didn't want people living under the tyranny of depression, the tyranny of sickness, the tyranny of addiction, the tyranny of self-loathing, the, the, the tyranny of insecurity. God didn't design you to live under some harsh taskmaster. God designed you to live in freedom. The Bible says this in 1 John 3, 8, that someone was sent to buy your freedom. It says this, for this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this reason, this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. See, the devil is the real entity that's oppressing humanity. The devil's the real author of sin, sickness, disease, anything that, that, that's coming and getting the best of you. That's not authored by God. That's been authored by the devil. Can I get an amen out there? Jesus came that you might have life and that you might have, hold, and possess it in abundance. But the thief came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the Bible says, for this reason, the Son of God was made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That you don't have to live under tyranny. You don't have to live under somebody else's control. I'm telling you, you can be free. How many of you out there would testify with me that Jesus Christ of Nazareth has set you free from something that used to bind you, used to hold you, used to get the best of you? Come on, somebody. Look at all these people say, Jesus set me free. I'm telling you, he's, he's the, the ultimate form of liberty. The Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, let's just say that out loud. Say, whom the Son sets free. Is free indeed. Let's say it again. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Come on, let's say it again. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You know, I, I use that scripture and scriptures like this to get free from addiction back in the late 90s. I took every deliverance from tyranny scripture I could find, every deliverance scripture that would, would get what the devil's put on me off of me and get what God wants to put on me on me, and I took those scriptures and I would sit alone in my apartment and I would read them out loud again and again. I'd just say them out of my mouth. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I submit myself to God. I resist the devil, and he flees from me. I, I walk in the Spirit and fulfill not the lust of the flesh. I have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. How can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed according to the Word of God. And I would quote and quote and say and say and release the Scripture into my life until finally the things that bound me didn't have the power to bind me anymore because my faith was built up and I got set free by the power of the word of the living God. I'm telling you, God's word has power to get you free, and it will work if you will work it. Can I get an amen out there? You know, people come to me all the time because they'll hear my testimony, and uh, they want me to talk to somebody with an addiction past or something like that, and they'll say things like, well, he just needs to talk to somebody he's been through. And I'm always like, nothing could be further from the truth. The last thing a junkie needs to get them free is another junkie. Can I get an amen? How many know we were all sinners and what did we need to get us free? Someone who had never sinned. Come on. You know where the best place to score dope in the city is? An NA meeting. I'm just telling you. Because somebody going through what you're going through can't get you free no matter what it is. You need someone that's perfect to get you free. There's only one that's perfect. Can I get an amen out there? He is the, the man from Galilee. Come on. The son of Joseph and Mary, but not just of Joseph, the son of God most high. For this reason, he was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Tell me, if the works of the devil are active in your life this morning, those works have already been destroyed 2,000 years ago. Stop looking for God to bless you and start looking and saying, God bless me at the cross. Come on, somebody, give God a hand clap if you believe it. You're not fighting for a victory. You're fighting from a victory. See, the very gospel screams out freedom for humanity. Romans 6.14 says this, talking about freedom and deliverance. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. 
Sin shall not have dominion over you. Come on. Somebody say, sin shall not have dominion over me. For I'm not under the law, but under grace. There's freedom in that, that sin no longer has to control you because of the gospel. The Bible says this, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I'm going to tell you that the goodness of the gospel brings freedom wherever it goes. But the freedom that it brings, it isn't free. The freedom that we have in the gospel, it came because someone sacrificed. And that someone by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He was nailed to a tree 2,000 years ago. He bled for our sin and died in our place. And now we celebrate freedom because somebody else sacrificed. How many are thankful for the countless number of men and women that sacrificed so we could have a free nation today? Come on, let's give them a hand clap. I'm telling you, somebody has to sacrifice. If, if somebody could come and help me play an instrument, I'm, I'm going to pray in one second. I want to I read to you something that um, is probably part historical and part legend now. And it's hard to separate uh, all of the historical facts from a little bit of legend. And a lot of history is like that. But this is a story that, that people tell about the framers of the Declaration of Independence, or the signers, excuse me, of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, you might do some study of this document yourself, and you can kind of see maybe a little bit of what's reality and what's legend. But it's powerful either way. Uh, here's, here's what it says. It says, uh, have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? What fate befell them for putting their name on that document? All right, five of the signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons serving in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? Twenty-four were lawyers and jurists. Eleven were merchants. Nine were farmers and large plantation owners. They were men of means, they were well-educated, but they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a planter and trader, saw his ship swept from the sea by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts, and he died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Vandals or soldiers looted the properties of Dillery, Hall, Clymer, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged George Washington to open fire. His home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. Norris and Livingston suffered similar fates. Such were the stories and the sacrifices of the American Revolution. Is anybody thankful out there for men who were willing to put their lives, their families, their fortunes, and their future on the line that we might live in the greatest nation on the planet? Come on, somebody give these men, the women, the families, a hand clap. Amen. Would you stand up on your feet with me? I want to I pray for you just for one moment, and then we're going to get out of here. If you close your eyes right where you are in front of me, just for one moment. You know, these guys, um, they paid a great price for our nation. Now, I want you to know a great price has been paid for our freedom by even many people in the room. But a greater price has been paid for your spiritual freedom. A greater price has been paid. 
The price of the Son of the living God. Innocent blood was shed, and that price has been paid on Calvary's cross. If you're out there under the sound of my voice and you say, Pastor, I don't know if I'm right with God or not. I've got good news for you. God's not mad at you. He's not pointing a finger at you. He's not wanting to get even with you. He's really calling you to himself, saying, come to me. I'll clean you up. Come to me. I'll give you a brand new start. Come to me. I'll I'll, I'll wash your sins. I'll bring you in. I'll fill you with the Spirit. Listen, Christ died for your sins. He was placed in a tomb. On the third day was resurrected. If you need to give your life to Jesus or you need to rededicate your life today, whenever I count to three, I want you to to lift your hand right where you are. I'm going to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out. I'm just going to pray with you. Whenever I count to three, I want you to lift your hand up right where you are. Don't, Don't let this moment pass you by. God's brought you here for a reason this morning. One, don't put it off. Two, you're here for a reason today. God's calling you. Three, just lift up that hand. Pastor, pray for me. I see that hand right there. I see that hand right there. Pastor, pray for me. We see you right there. God bless you. Anybody else, I've got one more moment for you. We see you right there. God bless you. Anybody else, I've got one more moment for you. Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. I need uh, uh, to rededicate my life or I need to come home. Any of those things, pray for me. Well, those of you that have lifted your hand, here's what I want to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to give you some words. You're going to give it the meaning. God's going to do the miracle of forgiving you. Come on, church. Let's let's pray with them this morning. Just say this to the Father right out of your heart. I'll give you the words. You give it the meaning. Come on, say this to the Father. Say this. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. I've lived for myself. I've done my own thing. But today, I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin to Jesus. I believe on his death, on his burial, on his resurrection for my salvation. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. Fill me with your spirit. I boldly declare that Jesus is my Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen, 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 amen. Amen.